Welcome to Online Worship with Hyde Park United Methodist. I'm Matt Hotho. My name's Justin LaRosa. We're so glad you're here today. Our mission is to make God's love real, teaching people to follow Jesus by loving God and loving all. Today, we're coming to you from the Portico Cafe, located at the Portico, our downtown location. So it's gonna be a little busy behind us. This is a cafe and event space that you can find out more about uh, by going to the QR code that's in the corner of your screen where you can also register your attendance. Now, today we're gonna be here for about 30 minutes. Justin, tell us a little bit about kind of what we're gonna be hearing about. So we're in the season of Lent, these 40 days, not including Sundays, where we prepare ourselves for Easter. And we're in the series Overflowing, and our senior pastor, Magre de Vega, is going to continue that series with us and teach us what it means to be overflowing. Welcome to worship. It's a new day. It's a new season. It's a new year. Well, your sin is dead and gone away, and your soul is being renewed. So lift up your eyes, God gave you a new beginning, a new day, a new season. I live my life making many mistakes. I thought there was no other way. And you told me I was just living afraid But you said you would help me out through it I said there's no hope for a wretch like me God said open up your eyes and see That it's a new day, it's a new season, it's a new year well, your sin is dead and gone away, and your soul is being renewed. So lift up your eyes, God gave you a new beginning, a new day, a new season. There's something about this new amazing grace. Makes me want to celebrate The old me gone, the sin is washed away I no longer have to dwell in it I thought I was lost, but you found me I'm so glad you helped me see That it's a new day, it's a new season Dead and gone away in your soul is being renewed. So lift up your eyes, God gave you a new beginning, a new day, a new season. No more living in the past, just too much ahead of me. Since your grace has set me free, I am living free. You have broken through the dark, now the sun shines down on me. You have told me I am free, so I am living free. Cause it's a new day, it's a new season, it's a new year. Where you sin this dead and gone away in your soul. Lift up your eyes, God gave you a new beginning. Cause it's a new day, it's a new season, it's a new year. Where your sin is dead and gone away in your soul. It's being renewed. So lift up your eyes, God gave you a new beginning, a new day. Your eyes, God gave you a new beginning, a new day. Lift up your eyes, God gave you a new beginning, a new day, a new season. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
As we enter our prayer time today, we prepare to hear a passage from Luke's gospel in which Jesus laments the brokenness and injustice of the city of Jerusalem. So we invite you to type into the chat section the persons, the communities, the situations in the world that break your heart today and are in need of God's healing and peace and justice. We certainly continue to lift up the suffering of the people of Ukraine and call for God's hope and peace to be among them. Let's pray together. Let us pray. As we experience the daily struggles, frustrations, and fears of life, may we see you, O Lord, as our refugee and fortress. When sometimes we feel lonely and far away from you, let us remember, O Lord, that nothing can separate us. In the times when we decide to navigate our life on our own and find ourselves in trouble, may we realize, O Lord, that wherever we go, you will find us. When we feel that we're not worthy, may we recall, O Lord, that we are your dear children, loved without condition. If we think that we've used up the last portion of your patient kindness, may we not forget, O Lord, that you shower us with grace and we shelter under your wings. All of these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Listen for the word of God from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. This reading comes from the New Revised Standard Version. At that very hour, some Pharisees came to him and said, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you are not willing See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The word of God for the world. Thanks be to God. We love images of a strong and mighty God, especially during times of hardship and suffering. A mighty fortress is our God, a very present help in times of trouble, says the psalmist. We like that. Greater is he who is in you, 1 John says, than he who is in the world. That's a helpful image too. We can also see why the doctrine of God's omnipotence has been so popular over the years. God is all-powerful, God can do anything, there is nothing that God cannot do. Christian philosophers from Rene Descartes to John Locke all subscribed in some way to the omnipotence of God. It's a notion that has been comforting even me throughout the years. However, at some point these images of an all-powerful God come up against the reality of suffering and evil in the world. And if God has all the power, then God is either causing or allowing suffering to happen. And suddenly that image is not quite as comforting. 
and we are in need of a different way to think about God's power. Well, that's where a scripture passage like today comes in, just at the right time. I've shared in the past a story from Walter Isaacson's biography of Apple founder Steve Jobs. Jobs grew up with parents who always desired Jobs to be raised in the Christian faith, so they started attending a Lutheran church with some regularity. When Jobs was 13 years old, he went in to see that Lutheran pastor, and in his hand was the latest cover of Life magazine from July 12, 1969. On the cover were two starving children, victims of the ongoing war in Biafra against Nigeria. And he asked the pastor, if I hold up my fingers, does God know how many fingers I'm about to hold up? And the pastor said, yes, God knows everything. And then Jobs showed the pastor the cover. Then does God know about this? And what's going to happen to these children? Well, the pastor stammered around with some answers, you know, yes, God knows, we don't understand, you know, that kind of thing. Jobs then announced that he didn't want to have anything to do with any kind of religion that believes in a God like that. And he never stepped foot in a church ever again. Eventually, the doctrine of omnipotence leaves us with a cold, hard calculation to make. If God is all-powerful and there is such suffering in the world, either that means that God caused that suffering or allowed it to happen, and neither option is very comforting after all. So today, on this stop along our Lenten journey, we receive great comfort from a very different image of God's power. It reminds us that the power God has is not one that forces us to act. God's power is one that calls and persuades us to act. God's power does not coerce us into action. God's power works through our actions and our participation. In today's scripture reading, Luke, the gospel writer, pulls back the curtain a bit to give us a privileged glimpse into the mind and heart of Jesus. He shows us a side of Jesus that is not only rare, but deeply personal. Jesus had just received some hurtful news. Pharisees came to warn him that Herod was out to kill him. So Jesus had better run and hide and flee for his life. But Jesus chose not to. Instead, he turned to those messengers and said some bold, courageous words. Go and tell that fox for me, listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I finish my work. Jesus was fearless and undaunted and focused on his mission, which was to save the world from its sin. And then, instead of turning and running away from Herod, he turned his face toward the city of Jerusalem. Instead of running away from the possibility of his own suffering, he turned toward the reality of suffering that many in Jerusalem were facing. He chose not to focus on his own problems with Herod, but focused instead on the violence, the political oppression, the economic disparity, and the social hardship that his fellow human beings were experiencing. And this is when we get an astonishing alternative view of the power of God. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. That is such a different picture of Jesus, isn't it? Not not one who is just wise or strong, but one who is devastated and hurt and empathetic and compassionate, and he desperately, desperately wants the people of Jerusalem, the people of God, to figure out that what they're doing is harmful and unhealthy and unholy, but they just can't seem to get it. This is a side of Jesus that so many of us can relate to. The parent, right, who wants desperately for their children to make the right decisions, but they know that they cannot control their child's choices. The married couple who has fallen out of love, trying to figure out how to make things work, knowing that they cannot control each other's reactions or emotions or choices. 
This is the image of longing and lamenting the choices that human beings have made at their worst. It was four years ago this month that the March for Our Lives movement spread across the country, including right here in Tampa. I spent some time with Grace and Maddie this past week reflecting on what it was like when each of us first heard word of the shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Many of you remember your feelings of helplessness and fear. And a passage like this one in Luke's gospel would remind us that Jesus laments the evil and injustice that humans commit against one another. As we continue to see the brutal evil of Vladimir Putin ravage the country of Ukraine, we see in this gospel a lamenting Jesus who longs for an end to the violence and an end to Russian aggression. It is here that we recognize an astonishing and at first troubling aspect of the nature of God. God cannot make us do something we willfully choose not to do. God is not coercive. God does not force us to do anything against our will. Since the days of John Wesley, Methodists have believed in human free will, in the capacity to choose. It was a gift that God gave to Adam and Eve and has given us ever since. And as the theological deduction goes, God cannot have all the power in the world if humans had the power to choose. Those two ideas are incompatible with one another. So where's the hope to be found? It's found in a very different kind of power that God has. Not the power to coerce and force us to act, but in the power to persuade and call us to action. In other words, maybe God's power is not an ability to make things happen or keep things from happening, but in God's constant and faithful, loving activity in luring and wooing and persuading human beings to choose the better rather than the worse. And in fact, in more persuasive power than any other in the world. Once upon a time, the north wind and the sun were arguing over who had more power. We shall have a contest, said the sun. Far below on earth, a man was traveling on a road while wearing a warm winter coat. As a test of strength, said the sun, let us see which of us can take the coat off that man. It'll be quite simple for me to force him to remove the coat, bragged the wind, boasting of his omnipotence. So the wind blew so hard that the birds clung to the trees and the world was filled with dust and leaves. But the harder the wind blew down the road, the tighter the shivering man clung to his coat. Then the sun came out from behind a cloud. Sun warmed the air and the frosty ground. The man on the road unbuttoned his coat. The sun grew slowly brighter and brighter, and soon the man felt so hot, he took off his coat and sat down in a shady spot. How'd you do that, said the wind. It was easy, said the sun. And here's where I paraphrase the conclusion. It's not about having all the power. It's about having the right kind of power. Maybe the power that God has is not an all-powerful kind of power that causes or allows things to happen. It would be much too hard to reconcile that image with the presence of suffering and evil in the world. So maybe God's power is something different, something that was best demonstrated in the great symbol for Lent, the great symbol of Christianity on the cross. For the cross was the ultimate object of suffering and evil and injustice that can happen to the innocent. And the power of God is found in God's ability to identify with us in the midst of our suffering and to call upon all of us to be agents of healing. God is the presence of love and goodness throughout all creation, constantly yearning and desiring and persuading the world to make choices toward harmony and beauty rather than chaos and harm. And God knows 
that because of our free will, we are always free to choose against God. That's what was happening in the heart of Jesus in this passage. This was a portrait of a longing and perhaps tearful Jesus who had to acknowledge that though he was empowered with the capacity to perform miracles and even raise people from the dead, the one thing that Jesus could not do, the one thing he chose not to do was force people to love, to love each other, and to love God. Because love is only love when you choose to give it and choose to receive it. So the good news of this passage is that God is powerful. It's not in a way that forces us to act, but in a way that acts through us, through our will to cooperate and choose God's best. That's the good news and the challenging news of Jesus. And it's an idea that is captured through this classic prayer attributed to St. Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us as a mother hen loves her young. Thank you for the moments when you have surrounded us and enveloped us and longed to take us under your wing. And thank you for a love that is persuasive, not coercive, and prompts us toward action. Empower us to participate in your love, to bring healing and justice and peace into the world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Every contribution from each one of us makes a huge difference, including the financial gifts we offer every week. So at this time, we invite you to give online via the donate button or quickly and privately via text message or through the mail. We also invite you to give generously toward relief for the people of Ukraine through our United Methodist Committee on Relief. There is a link in the Next Steps QR code in the corner of your screen that you can refer to. And among the many ways your giving helps to make God's love real is through our cold weather shelter, which has cared for unhoused persons in our community during particularly cold nights of these last few months. Your giving helps make that vital ministry happen. And we thank you for your generosity. We've been offering cold night shelters when the temperature drops below 40 degrees. It's a place where people can come inside for a warm welcome, a warm blanket, a soft mat, a nice cup of coffee, and conversation together where we share our stories, get to know each other. We're more than statistics. We're people. Hi, I'm Vicki Walker, Minister of Missions and Outreach at Hyde Park United Methodist Church in Tampa. You know, Jesus reminds us that as we treat the least of these, it's how we treat him. Because God resides in each and every person. And so my invitation to you is for you to ponder this question, how will you react when Jesus shows up to you this week, this day? In the most unsuspecting person, in the most unsuspecting way, will you be open to opening a blanket, to opening your heart, to opening your hands, to opening your eyes, to see in him among the least of us? He invites you.
Thanks so much for joining us for worship today. We want to make sure you know about two next steps that you can take. And you can find out more about each of these by going to the QR code that's on the screen right now. One of the ways you can connect and journey on the way towards Easter is to get our daily text. We send it out each day at 10 a.m. And you can sign up, comes right to your phone, and you can read the daily prayer. And the next thing you can do is you can just follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And those are great ways to just stay connected with us as we journey towards Easter so that you know about what's coming up and so that you know about our upcoming Easter services and things like that. So thanks so much for being here. Justin, you want to send us on our way? So if you're comfortable, you can keep your eyes open or closed, but reach your hands out in this posture of uh, receiving refuge from God, which is what we heard about today. Let's pray together. God of light and of love, we give thanks for the love revealed in Jesus. Help protect us, guide us, help us to be the people that you've called us to be this week. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Go in peace. Have a great week.